Thank you all so much for joining. My name is Jill Gamble. I'm part of the leadership team for the Georgia Climate Project. I'm also a Coastal Resilience Specialist at the University of Georgia for Marine Extension and Georgia Sea Grant. The Georgia Climate Project is a statewide network of universities and uh, partners working to explore uh, climate change impacts and solutions in Georgia. We have a um, nine university network of academic partners, um, as well as a very broad network of nonprofit, environmental organizations, private sector partners, helping to um, expand research and dialogue on, on climate change in Georgia. We'd like to thank our funders without whom this webinar series would not be possible. Um, particularly the Ray C. Anderson Foundation, as well as our other uh, funders and donors. So the Georgia Climate Project looks at two central questions. What does a change in climate mean for Georgia and what can we do about it? We'll be answering or hoping to answer those questions in this webinar today in relation to agriculture in Georgia. I'd like to share just a few initiatives before we begin uh, where we would love to engage you all and um, and learn from each other. One is our Georgia Climate Information Portal. With this, we've tried to synthesize some of the, the key impacts of climate change in Georgia, um, as well as uh, strategies that communities are taking to, to combat or adapt. Um, we have pages in there on health, public health, uh, Georgia's ecosystems, as well as uh, coastal Georgia and, and our oceans. Um, and we'll be soon adding a page on agriculture. This is the sixth webinar in our, in our series this academic year. Uh, all of these uh, webinars are available on our YouTube channel and, and Rachel will post uh, in the chat um, the link so that if any of you are interested, we've had a fantastic lineup of speakers um, throughout. And uh, so please feel free to, to watch these and, and um, learn a little bit more about um, some of the impacts that are occurring across the state and how people are responding. We have two more webinars coming up, uh, one on equity and justice next month, April 28th, and one on infrastructure on May 26th. Another initiative of the Georgia Climate Project is our Georgia Climate Story Series. Um, these are telling the personal stories of, of folks who are dealing with challenges and who are taking steps to, to resolve them. So some of the, the current stories that you would find in, on, um, in the series are on drought resilience, uh, food waste, blueberry farming, and we'll post that in the chat as well, the link in case you'd like to check out some of those stories. In August, we have a, a statewide conference that we invite you all to, to attend. Um, it will be August 12th and 13th on Jekyll Island. Um, this is the third statewide climate conference that we've had here in Georgia. Uh, and a big thank you to the Georgia Department of Natural Resources Coastal Resources Division, who's taking the leadership on, on the 2021 conference. We have a call for posters open right now uh, until June 1st. So if you have any work that you'd like to share, please consider uh, applying. And finally, follow us on social media. We would love to engage with you all, um, learn about efforts that you're working on, and also uh, communicate things, events, trainings, that, that we have in the works. So just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, in this webinar, you're gonna notice that you have a, a chat option and a Q&A option. In the chat, please feel free to introduce yourself. Let us know uh, where you are, who, who you are. <laughs> um, and the Q&A, we'll use that as our presenters are speaking. If you have any questions for them, please enter them there. They'll be able to type in real time uh, answers and then we'll also answer live uh, in the webinar as many as we can. As you exit the webinar, an evaluation link will pop up. Uh, please take a second just to provide feedback. Let us know how we've done and um, if there's any additional topics that you'd like to learn about, we would be really interested in hearing your thoughts. So today we're going to be talking about what does a changing climate mean for Georgia's agriculture? We have a fantastic lineup, and I'm going to start by introducing our moderator for today. Dr. Carrie Furman is an environmental anthropologist in the Department of Crop and Soil Sciences at the University of Georgia. 
She has worked with the Southeast Climate Consortium on multidisciplinary projects that aim to assess the relevance, accessibility, and usefulness of climate-based decision support tools for extension agents, organic farmers, and African-American producers in the Southeast. Currently, she is part of the Floridan Aquifer Collaborative Engagement for Sustainability, also known as FACETS team, and focuses on social learning and stakeholder engagement. So please join me in welcoming Carrie, and I will turn it over to you now. Hi, Jill and everybody else. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, really appreciate this opportunity. And I'd really like to thank the um, Georgia Climate Project for putting on great webinars, such as this one and the ones that we have in the past and, and coming up. Um, so it's a really great way to uh, get together and share knowledge about agriculture and climate change in Georgia. Um, it's a huge and really important topic here in Georgia. So I'd like to thank all the panelists for participating. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first panelist today, Pam Knox. And Pam is an extension climatologist that specializes in agriculture and is the director of the Georgia, University of Georgia Weather Network. The Weather Network provides weather and climate data to farmers, utilities, extension agents, and private citizens, as well as supports the National Weather Service by providing real-time weather information and in hazardous weather outbreaks. Thanks so much for coming, Pam, and take it away. Well, it's great to be here today. Let me get my slides going. All right, whoops, speeding ahead. Of, as Carrie mentioned, I spend a lot of time studying the relationship between climate and agriculture. And so I'm gonna spend just a few minutes setting the stage for the rest of the speakers today by talking about how climate and agriculture intersect. You can see a little sad picture there of some corn that was affected by a dry spell during pollination. And so it didn't really fill up very well. So what I've got here is just a start by defining what climate is. And unlike um, what common definition of climate is, which is usually just the, the average weather, climate is actually something that's a lot more complicated than that. And so um, this is an example of what we call a thermograph. Thermograph for Atlanta, there's a website there. You can go and pick an, a thermograph for your own area. You do have to sign up for a free uh, user ID if you do that. Um, this has a lot of information. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I did want to point out a few things. The green bar that you see is the average high and low temperature for every day of the year uh, based on the last 30 years. And then the red is the extreme high temperatures for that day and the blue, the extreme low temperatures for that day. And superimposed on that, you see the gray bars, which is the values that we actually had in 2020. And so, um, Every year is different. They all have a lot of different characteristics. You see a lot of ups and downs in the spring and winter. And then in the summer, we have a lot more uh, stable climate where the climate is really pretty similar from day to day. Um, so the averages are included on here, but also the ranges, uh, extremes, and the cycles that you see, both the natural cycle there of the seasons, but also if you look at multi-years, you can see other cycles like El Nino showing up as well. And for farmers, the averages are probably the least important because they can deal with the averages much better than they can deal with the extremes. And so that's something that we really want to look at when we're looking at the effects of uh, climate on agriculture. One thing I think is important to keep in mind is that what you think has happened to the climate really depends on how old you are, what time period you're looking at. And I like to show these pictures of my husband and son just to show you that some changes are natural and some are not. Um, you can see here, this is my husband about 20 years ago and our son Evan, who was six at the time, um, the tree behind them is a chestnut oak, which was about 80 before we had to cut it down. Uh, it was leaning a little too close toward the house. And then the rifle that John is holding is an old family heirloom, which is about 150 or so years old from Kentucky. Uh, the, the smaller picture on the right shows a more recent picture of John and Evan. You can see John has gotten a little grayer and Evan has gotten a lot taller. And that's just a natural change that we're seeing. The climate changes naturally, but there's also other changes going on in the background. You can see all those buildings. This is, that's in New York City on the high line. Um, we're changing the environment too, and that's causing effects on our climate. 
Here's an image that shows the Georgia temperature trend. This is annual average temperatures starting in 1895 on the left and uh, 2020, which is the last complete year, of course, on the right. And you can see there's a lot of interesting information. Again, we could spend a long time talking about this. For farmers, probably what's the most interesting thing and the thing that's the most worry to them is that year to year variability. What's it gonna be like in the next growing season? How am I gonna, how am I gonna deal with whatever that climate is? And then, uh, you know, what do I do with it? And it really depends on what kind of farming you're doing. If you're doing crops, you're worried about the next year. If you're worried about livestock, it might be a few years. If you're worried about forests, and you know, forestry in Georgia is an agricultural crop um, in, a, in large extent, then you're worried about something on a much longer time scale. And so not everybody is looking down the, down the road the same distance. Um, and so all of these things are important. But what we need to remember is that for the average life of most farmers, which is about 60 years, that average temperature has been rising steadily. There's ups and downs for sure, but it's definitely been rising over that time. And there's no sign that that's likely to end anytime soon. In fact, the computer models say that's going to continue. And that's something that farmers are gonna to have to deal with. It's also important to keep in mind that what's happening here in the Southeast is not necessarily what's happening in other parts of the country. Um, this is a picture of the the average trend in temperature over time over the last 100 years. And the redder it is, the faster it's getting warmer. And so you can see here in the southeast, we're actually blue. There's parts of the southeast that have gotten cooler over the last 100 years. We call that the, the southeast warming hole. And there's a, a, a bunch of different reasons why that's occurring. Land use changes are probably part of it. Uh, increase in aerosols over time uh, as we burn a lot of coal and things like that and also just the position on the, on the continent. Um, so all those are factors that allow us to stay cooler here relative to other parts of the country. And so if you talk to people in other parts of the country, their experience might not be the same as yours either. For precipitation, this is again, a long-term trend from 1895 to 2020 that shows the year-to-year -year annual rainfall. And you can see there's not really a trend in the annual rainfall. Uh, stayed pretty close to 50 inches uh, for most of the last 100 years. Obviously, there's ups and downs, and that's very important to the farmers, but there's not a real trend upward or downward over time, although there have been some shifts in particular seasons. So if I showed you seasons, you might see a little bit more shifts. Other thing that's kind of interesting to note is that in the last 20 years, we've had a lot more experiences of having two years in a row that have been dry. If you look in the past, that hasn't happened so often, but that's definitely happening more now. And that's probably contributing to our droughts that we've had over the last 20 years. Again, the Southeast is not like a lot of the rest of the US. We're a lot drier here. Some of that is probably just because we've had a lot of droughts the last 20 years or so. But other parts of the country are seeing a lot more moisture come in. In fact, there are places in the North Central part of the US that can grow corn where they never used to be able to grow wheat because it was just too dry. And that is changing. And so that is something that our farmers have to deal with because they're all in the same market together. One of the things that doesn't show up on an annual precipitation map is how much the rain is coming in heavy rainfalls, which we usually define as about two inches uh, in a day. So if we have two inches in a day, that's a pretty heavy rain, a good downpour from a thunderstorm. That has increased in the southeast by about 27%. So if, if the annual average isn't changing, but we're getting more of these heavy rains, that means we're also getting longer dry spells in between the events. And that is critical for agricultural production because those plants are thirsty and they have to drink. And so those dry spells are really of concern. So how does the changing climate affect agriculture? Well, there's a lot of different ways. You have the warmer temperatures, which means a longer growing season for crops, but also for diseases and insect pests. Um, the higher temperatures also cause more heat stress on livestock, if you're growing cattle, um, for example, and the outdoor workers, because you know they have to work outside in that heat as well. Um, we know that with a longer growing season, the plants come out of dormancy earlier, they start sipping all that water from the soil moisture. And so there's a higher demand for water from evapotranspiration. And that means it changes the long-term water balance of the uh, soil and the plants that are in, the, in that soil. Longer dry spells is gonna add stress to crops, especially if you don't have irrigation, if you're doing dry land uh, farming. And so 
you've got to figure out ways to really keep that moisture in the soil. We're likely to also have more frequent droughts as that water, um, that water demand increases. Changes in seasonal precipitation are going to affect things like planting and harvest. We know that, that it's getting wetter in the fall when we usually harvest things. And that's going to affect our ability to get in the fields. And so that's something of concern. The longer dry spells could affect crop pollination and affect things like the corn I showed on the first page. We also know that we're going to get heavier rain too. The water cycle is really going to ramp up. So we're going to have more heavy rains. That means more increased erosion and infrastructure challenges. Roads could be washed out, uh, power could be out, and those could all affect uh, agriculture as well. But there's also a counter, counterpoint to this, that's agriculture also affects the climate. This is an example that shows the greenhouse gas sources by different sectors of the economy. And you can see the green bar there um, shows, or the green pie chart shows that the food and land use, which is basically agriculture, accounts for about 24% of all emissions of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, and other gases like nitrous oxide. And so it's really a low hanging fruit for changing things if we want to reduce our emissions of greenhouse gases. So how does agriculture affect climate? Well, as I said, agriculture produces about 24% of all the greenhouse gases. And it comes from a variety of different sources, including livestock production, and rice production, uh, not such a big deal in the Southeast now as it used to be, but still there's some. Uh, food waste is a huge one, and we don't really think about that, but that's certainly one where consumers have a lot, a big role to play, because a lot of food is wasted. And so when you waste that food, you're wasting the water and the fuel that it takes to produce that food and get it to market. Um, and then clearing of land is another one. So if you look at it, if you break it down a little further, livestock, rice, deforestation, and draining swamps all release methane. Methane is important because it's a very powerful greenhouse gas. And it has a short lifetime in the, in the atmosphere, but it's very powerful. It's very strong at uh, trapping heat near the surface. Carbon dioxide takes a little bit longer. That's released by things like deforestation, cutting down plants, uh, cutting down trees. Some plants do better in a higher carbon dioxide atmosphere, but they have to have enough water and they have to have the right soil and nutrients to be able to grow. And of course, weeds are plants too, so they also like the, the better uh, carbon dioxide. And so that's something to keep in mind. And then other things like fertilizer releases nitrogen into the atmosphere and that converts to nitrous oxide, which is another greenhouse gas. So agriculture is doing a lot of things to put greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Both of these things are important because really the last uh, century or so, we've seen unprecedented changes in the amount of carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere. And a lot of that has come from agriculture. Uh, carbon dioxide, probably more from burning of fossil fuels, but also land use changes have had an impact. And you can see we've had long changes over thousands of years, but we've had a spike over the last 100 years. And that's because we've had so much increase in uh, carbon dioxide and other emissions over time. And the same thing is true with methane. So how can agricultural producers respond to the changing climate? There's really two ways to do it. One is mitigation. You want to try to prevent the release of greenhouse gases before they even get into the atmosphere. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. I think we're going to hear some of those today. Uh, smart irrigation reduces the water use and fuel to, to pump irrigated water. Cover crops can reduce the need for water and fertilizer. Uh, they're experimenting with changes in animal feed, like for cattle. Um, if they feed them seaweed, they re reduce the amount of methane that they emit. Um, changes in food waste also reduces wasted fuel, labor, and water. But we also have to learn how to adapt. The, their conditions are going to change, and we're going to have to deal with that. And so strategies for that are changing the management that you're, that you're using, changing the crops that you're growing, uh, changing how you use water. And um, those will all help us to adapt. So there's things like new crops that are growing into the, gr into the ground now, like olives and satsumas here in Georgia. They didn't used to be able to grow here, but now because the climate has changed, they're starting to grow. And there are other ways as well. Small scale irrigation can help get you through dry spells. A shade structure can cool livestock. So I wanna just conclude here with the last slide. Uh, what does the future hold? I think just like anything else, there's a lot of challenges that we're gonna have to deal with from the warmer temperatures 
including things like the heat stress and the potential for drought. But there's also opportunities here. There, there are ways to uh, get new things into the market. There are potential for new markets. Um, and we're going we're gonna to be dealing in an area where we might be able to grow some new crops. And we can also share what we learned with other parts of the country because we're warmer than they are. And so they're going to really look to us as an example for how to live in a warmer climate. And I think that's my last slide. So I will turn it over back to Carrie. Thanks, Pam. That was great. Uh, we have a couple of questions. I uh, wanted to start out with one about um, the hurricanes. Uh, the last few years, we've received quite a bit of agricultural damage from hurricanes like Irma and Michael. How are hurricanes expected to change in the future as temperatures get warmer? Yeah, hurricanes are on a lot of people's minds now because we've had a lot of damage from Irma and uh, Michael, of course, and, and other hurricanes. Uh, it used to be that we used to, we thought that hurricane numbers were not changing that much over time. But of course, you know, they go to different places every year. So they're rare events wherever they hit. But the latest research is now showing that not only are the numbers starting to go up, but also they're moving slower and they're getting more intense. That means they're going to have more wind damage, which is a, a huge problem for forests and for crops that might lodge like corn. Um, the slower means that they're more likely to drop really heavy rainfall, which will cause more flooding and more erosion. And so if the numbers go up, that may or may not affect us in Georgia, but certainly the, the wetter hurricanes and the stronger winds are both going to be detrimental to agriculture. Excellent. Uh, we have one last question. Um, we have a student from Emory, Joel uh, Lerner, who asked the question if um, food waste could be attributed more to, um, so if food waste could be attributed more to consumer action or if logistics and food transportation could be responsible for a large portion of these emissions. Do you have any information on how food waste kind of plays into the climate change? There, there was a publication in the last week that came out where they traced uh, the different carbon uh, parts of the whole food waste issue. Um, and it shows that a lot of it comes from the production process. So either you're, you're producing the grain and you're putting it into warehouses or you're, you're transforming it into edible food, but still about a quarter of it is food waste that's caused by consumers. And that's where you buy something and it sits in your refrigerator like I've got now. Um, and you don't cook it on time and you end up throwing it out. If you've, if you've got a, a compost pile, you might put it in that. Otherwise you might put it in the trash. Um, so there are certainly some ways if you buy local, there are some benefits um, to reduce transportation costs, but transportation is a relatively small part of the uh, food production process. So um, that is something that can be helpful, but you can also just you know be more careful about what you, what you buy and use it as much as you can. Great, thanks. For, uh, for time purposes, I think we're gonna move on. There's a couple of questions that if you've got a second or you feel like you're able to, Pam, you can type those out in the chat feature. So moving on, our next speaker is Sed Rowe. Sed Rowe is the owner and operator of Rowe Organic Farms, LLC, based in Albany, Georgia. He specializes in agritourism, heritage farming, and organic growing and is one of only three Georgia farmers successfully growing certified organic peanuts. And I think that is pretty amazing. Um, Said is also chapter president of the Southern Georgia Young Farmers Coalition, founding member of the Georgia Organic Peanut Association and a partner of the Black Farmers Network. Said, um, feel free to start and uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for the, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. All right. Thank you for having me. So like you said, my name is Bro. I, um, I'm an organic farmer, first generation farmer. Um, I also have a master in um, public health with a concentration in environmental health. And, you know, climate change, you know, has been affecting my farm for a while now. Um, as you know, we're based on the hurricanes that we've been having, um, temperatures changing, you know, late in the year, 
Um, when he usually is cold, it's still warm. So one of the biggest challenges to me that um, comes with climate change is how to reduce, because um, agriculture plays an important vital role in, in, you know, in our life. So, you know, trying to maintain agriculture requires, you know, in my opinion, heavy equipment or just tractors that can, you know, p work long hours and do hard labor stuff, but are also ran off of diesel. Um, as you know, they're been trying to make ways to, you know, lessen the pollution of tractors throughout the field. Um, that's a big um, pollution problem, climate change problem. Um, also something to keep in mind is just knowing that um, when you don't do your right conservation practices, when it comes to land, you know, trees or anything like that, it also affects the climate. Um, we don't focus a lot on trees that much. Um, trees give off carbon dioxide and give off other things that help us, you know, to breathe and, you know, just keep the air and everything else clean. So when we don't do the proper conservation practices, such as, um, for example, um, control burning, um, burning off your wood, wooded area, um, stuff like that, or, you know, just getting rid of um, excess vegetation to, that also can cause, you know, some effects to the climate. We don't, you know, we tend to focus on stuff that's put in the air and, um, you know, like emissions off cars or tractors or factories, you know, those are big pollutants, but, you know, some of the big climate change problems is based on how, what we're doing to the land and what we're not doing to the land. Um, so, you know, practicing good conservation is a way to, you know, start to, you know, help out with climate change on our part. Um, and I also like to say, you know, it's kind of hard to to say what is, you know, how can you address climate change because it's nature, you know, um, the times of the year is changing. Winter is going to get pushed back further. Summer is going to get pushed back longer. So, you know, we have to, as farmers, we have to learn to adapt. Um, I can tell you now that I'm planting peanuts earlier than I used to plant peanuts just because right now we're getting hot degree weather. Um, but then, it, you know, then again, you know, it also affects the growth of our peanuts also because the peanuts are not used to growing that time of the year that early. So, you know, not only it's affecting me when it comes to planting, but it's also affecting me, affecting me when it comes to quality of my product. Um, as anyone know that farms, um, the temperature, weather plays a viable role in anything you do. And um, part of the quality of that comes with um, pollination. Um, you also can see, you know, bees, bees and um, other pollinators are not as um, thriving as they, as they used to be anymore. So um, paying attention to nature and how nature acts lets you know how um, to adapt to your environment. So, you know, people try to put bees on their property just to pollinate their, their crops. And you're hearing cases how bees are disappearing or you know, just not coming back to the hive, you know, just because of the weather. Uh, we're experiencing um, insects in this part of Georgia that we never even seen or heard of before. So um, paying attention to animals and your, um, you know, your, your animals and your your trees and stuff around you also tells you, you know, how big of a change it is in your area. Um, so some of the ways that I um, feel like we can address climate change would be by, you know, coming up with different ways to, um, you know, tra people still using older tractors that, you know, have, you know, giving off smog or black black um, smoke coming from the exhaust pipe. So, you know, just upgrading our um, equipment. We have to update the era of farming with the time of the climate change. So since the climate is changing, our equipment and our farming ways and operation has to change with that in order to, you know, stay on a balanced scale with it. So, um, yeah, there's just some of the stuff that I can speak on right now. That's fantastic, Seth. And I think you brought up a lot of really important questions. Uh, I was looking through to see uh, some of them that are, that are, 
coming in. Um, one thing that you mentioned was this need to switch to new technologies and um, as a way to kind of adapt and move forward or using different kinds of conservation practices. Is there support out there or have you been able to tap into any support uh, mechanisms, uh, either financial or social that helps farmers um, adapt? Um, I have not. Um, I know it's um, it's certain type of um, like with government agencies such as like NRCS, um, Natural Resource Soil Conservation, that government um, agency they deal with a lot of conservation practices that helps the um, you know people maintain the land and practicing um, soil nutrient management and um, stuff like that. So that's that's like a small step, but I can't you know, say that I know of any, you know, technology or assistance that's out there that's been provided, so. Well, I think that definitely points to um, something that um, we need to work on here to help the help farmers out. Another question is coming from Bill Taylor at the University of Georgia. He's a graduate student. And uh, with reduced tillage being more difficult to implement in organic production, what are some ways you are able to use conservation practices to mitigate environmental degradation from heavy tillage? Um, some ways would be uh, different type of cover crops, um, planting something that uh, a cover crop such as um, a rye or wheat, or maybe plenty of others out there, but cover crop helps um, you know, helps when, when you have a tillage problem, when, you know, you're trying to minimize tillage. Um, it also helps with um, suppression of, of weeds. And I tell people, every plant give off something to the um, atmosphere. So when you see pollen and dust flying around, a lot of that stuff is, you know, pollen from plants and stuff. So eliminating um, invasive species that, you know, that gives off, um, you know, just, you know, just get rid of invasive species. That, you know, that's one way to that you know, I would say cover crop planting when it comes to, you know, difficult on um, no tilling. Um, I just, you know, I'm an organic farmer myself, so I do both a lot of tillage and I also do little tillage. Um, and I tell people, you know, understand the soil because um, if you ever be been in a field farming like early in the morning or the day that you know, you're here in the field and tilling, you can see like just Part of particle, particles coming up from the soil. So I tell people what you put in the soil comes back up into the air. So, you know, when you, when you're, the less you do to your soil, the less you do to the sky. So, you know, you're, you're helping with the environment also. So soil plays a viral role in you know, climate change, in my case. That's excellent. Thanks so much, Sed, and thanks for your presentation. And we'll, um, we're gonna have more questions later in a panel discussion, so we can ask him some more in a little bit. Um, okay. Up next, we have Casey Cox. Casey Cox is a sixth generation of her family uh, to farm on the Flint River in uh, South Georgia. Her family farm, Longleaf Ridge, produces sweet corn, peanuts, field corn, soybeans, and timber. Casey also managed the Flint River Soil and Water Conservation District and has served as Georgia's alternative board member on the National Peanut Board. Welcome, Casey. We're so excited to have you here. Thank you, Carrie. I'm really excited to, to share a little bit about our farm with, with everyone today. Uh, this is a topic that I'm really passionate about because um, I, growing up, my parents really instilled a value of stewardship in me. And so I've always been drawn to conservation and sustainability. And I, I think that's more important now than ever. It's something that, that we've always uh, been, been passionate about, but I, I see now with the future and all the challenges that we face in the environmental realm that really focusing on that is, is, is something that is going to be really important. Our farm in Southwest Georgia, we grow sweet corn, peanuts, field corn, soybeans, and pine trees. And our farm is actually on the Flint River. So since I moved back to the farm about eight years ago, I've been really 
in, engaged and involved with issues around water. Um, for those of you who may not know, where uh, that Georgia is in the middle of a Supreme Court lawsuit with Florida over water in this river basin that we live on, uh, and a lot of it has to do with agricultural water use. And so I've been a huge advocate for uh, sharing the story of what we are doing um, from an efficiency and conservation standpoint with water. That's that's really important to me and. I just know from my, my experience growing up here and being on the farm, um, it, it just really, even in my lifetime, it seems like we're having more extremes over the last couple of decades. Uh, growing up, at, we had two 500 year floods within four years. And um, we've had even more flood events these last few years, but we've also had long-term droughts that have really impacted our farm and impacted our region in a negative way. Um, I, I had somebody tell me one time that when Mother Nature is your business partner, you never know what to expect. And uh, that's certainly true when it comes to our, our changing climate as well. And I, I will say that my perspective on climate resilience and adaptation and what, what we do to help mitigate those risks from climate change fundamentally changed uh, two years ago. In October of 2018, Hurricane Michael uh, came barreling through uh, our region of Southwest Georgia and, and down from the panhandle of North Florida. And it absolutely devastated our region. I had always viewed climate resilience and adaptation through the lens of drought and increasing water use efficiency and irrigation. And I also looked at uh, building resilience through diversification. We grow vegetables, we grow peanuts, we grow timber. And the intensity and severity of that weather event opened my eyes and made me realize that's too narrow of a view on the type of challenges we face and what we really have to do to be prepared for the future. And so it motivated me to start thinking about what does resilience look like in the long term? I love the technology that we get to use and the efficiency um, and the conservation practices we've adopted, but I really had to start thinking about resilience in a totally different way. Um, watching, we, we essentially, what Hurricane Michael felt like was a six hour tornado over our entire community. And so just realizing that something that devastating can happen overnight uh, was, was really challenging and painful, but I think it was really, really important for me to experience that early in my career. And when, one thing that I'm, I'm um, really motivated to do is start thinking about resilience, both in the terms of environmental resilience, but also economic resilience. How do, how do we, uh, if we had another event like that, how do we build um, a new type of business or a new stream of income that can really give us a safety net if we were to um, experience something like that again. It, it devastated our crops. It, it got our, you know, several of our trees and it, it was just a really painful uh, economically as well as just emotionally. It was a really traumatic event. So, um, you know, every generation of my family that has farmed has had some kind of major challenge to face, but there's also been significant innovation. It's, it's amazing to compare what farming was like when my dad started versus what we're doing now. We can grow about twice as much on the same land now just because of new technologies, new varieties, new practices. So we're really getting more efficient and sustainable in so many ways. And there's just more of an opportunity than ever to really embrace that. Um, and, and one thing I'm also really passionate about when it comes to climate and talking about these issues, I truly feel that the agricultural people in the ag industry and forest landowners, we have a role to play. We have a, a really big role to play and we need to be a voice at the table. So um, that's why I'm really grateful for opportunities like this to share a little bit of our perspective um, because we do certainly care about uh, the land and our natural resources, because we we completely rely on on that for our our livelihoods. They're totally intertwined, and so I, I I'm trying to speak up and and participate in the conversation as much as possible, and encourage other farmers, like said, to be involved because. Every farmer is different. My neighbor's farm is different from my farm and um, the farms across Georgia are all extremely different and diversified. And so we all um, need to work together to figure out what solution, how we can be a part of the solution and, and how we can be at the table. So I mentioned earlier, I really have two perspectives on how we're responding to climate change and, and the challenges that we face. I look at it through both economic lens because of course our farm is, is first and foremost a business. And I have to think about 
what makes sense for our livelihoods and how to support our, our family. Um, but then of course, I also think about it from through an environmental lens and making sure that we're taking care of the natural resources and optimizing the natural resources that we have to use. Um, I was so fortunate when I first moved back to Southwest Georgia to work for our local conservation district, the Flint River Soil and Water Conservation District. And I did that for about six and a half years and was able to work with some of the most, really some of the best and brightest in agriculture and conservation. And one of the themes that we really uh, built on and, and focused on is, is conservation through innovation. And, and I love that because finding those practices that would enhance our, our conservation of natural resources, but also optimize on farm efficiency. Those are win-win scenarios. No farmer is going to, to disagree with something that helps them streamline efficiency, but then also helps conserve natural resources. So finding, um, using technology and innovation to really drive those practices and adopt new, new measures that could really make an impact on a large scale. Um, and, and one other thing, that is uh, that I'm really passionate about. I could I could talk all day about longleaf pines. That's what our farm is named after. Is is the, uh, the longleaf pine ecosystem that goes along the Flint River on our property, and economically, we're really not utilizing our land in the smartest way from an economic perspective because um, longleaf pines can live to be 300 to 400 years old. Um, but for us, there's a value beyond the, the economic value for those. So we manage some of our, our, our timber um, as more of like an eco, ecosystem, eco-management style, but then we also do have some commercial timber. So we, we try to find that balance um, even though keeping timber is very high risk for things like hurricanes, um, we, we learned the hard way that overnight we may not have that source of, of income, but we really, that's, that's one of the things that's important to me. We actually have more timber than we do cropland, and so that's one way that we're kind of trying to mitigate some of those climate risks as well. And then from a diversification standpoint, I'm no longer looking at it within the box of, oh, I need to come up with a new crop to grow or I need to think about um, trying something new on the farm, I'm looking at it as how can I build a business that's complementary to the farm, but if something like Hurricane Michael were to happen again, we would, we would have some stability, economic resilience and stability. And so, like I said, that has really uh, forced me to think outside the box, which has been a great opportunity for me early in my career. And, and I'm thankful that my dad has been so supportive of that as well. Um, another thing I can talk about all day, in addition to longleaf pine trees, is some of the, the conservation practices that we use on our farm and some of the technologies that we've adopted. And, and really, these are some of these are just common sense. Uh, we don't even really think about them as conservation practices or things we're doing uh, to, to you know, combat climate change. Just, they're, just, they're just common sense solutions. Like for example, crop rotation, that's better for all of our crops to rotate them, but it's also good for the land. Um, we started using GPS based systems on our tractors, which is heavily increased efficiency on the farm. And that's something that also has conservation value and it makes sense for us from an economic perspective. Um, and, and those are two things farmers have adopted on a widespread scale because it increased efficiency for them as well. So those are the kind of practices that are, that are just common sense. Um, I am a huge proponent of voluntary incentive-based conservation programs. I know said touched on uh, some of the programs that are available through USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service. And those are a really, really huge way to, um, to, to help lower that economic barrier. So I'm a big fan of those. And um, we also use sensors and apps and remote control and automation. There's just, there's all kinds of exciting things happening in the world of technology and agriculture and just incredible work going on across the state. So I really appreciate the opportunity Community that um, the Georgia Climate Project has given us to highlight some of those. And if you're if you're curious to learn more, definitely check out what the University of Georgia is doing and, and what some of the farmers across the state are doing in the realm of precision ag. Thank you all so much again for the opportunity. Thank you, Casey, so much. That was so much great info. And it's so great to hear about what, what farmers are out there doing. Uh, we have a question from Bill Taylor, a UGA graduate student. 
Um, did the, two, the 2011 drought that seriously affected farmers of the Flint River Basin motivate many farmers to rethink their adoption or non-adoption of conservation practices for improving water quality and reducing irrigation? Uh, absolutely. I think that had a big impact. I know it had a big impact on me and my family um, because it wasn't just 2011, it was 2012 too. So it was a back-to-back -back drought. It was really difficult for farmers in our community. And, and irrigation is probably the single most effective risk management strategy that we have in agriculture. But we, we've gotten so much more efficient since center pivot systems were first introduced. But that that pressure along with the, the the Supreme Court case coming up and just a couple of years later was was definitely a huge wake up call. Um, farmers have, in, in our area have been really in tune to water issues for decades now, but I think that was a really, um, that was a big wake up call that conservation is, is definitely needed and, and we have to continue working together to conserve conserve our water resources. Uh, we have one more question, and this this goes out to Casey and said, but I think we'll we'll ask you now, Casey and said uh, in the panel we can we can circle back if we have some time, but as as um, Emily Birchfield, a assistant professor at Emory, and has a lot of interest in crop diversity and how climate change will transform uh, cultivation for farmers in the Southeast. So do you use crop insurance and how does access to crop insurance affect your seasonal cultivation decisions and or um, usage or, or uh, your concerns about climate related damages? I'll start really quickly on that, Carrie. Um, and, and just to be honest, I, I will be very transparent that we are not a typical farmer when it comes to this. I actually um, have, have, we've never really, we've tried to use crop insurance in the past, but our primary crop is sweet corn, the vegetable, and there just aren't a lot of great programs out there to cover vegetables. And when we, we had crop insurance in the past, and then we had a wind event and all of our corn blew down and then the insurance company wasn't interested in, in helping us with that. So that, that was kind of like, well, what's the point of, of having this? So I may not be the best person to ask that question. I know that's a, um, that's a really important topic and, and kind of the standard agriculture. So um, I, I definitely think that's an important question and I'll let Sed speak to his experience, but we, we just are a little different in that regard. So, Sed, yeah, are you um, able to jump on? Yeah, you hear me? Yes. So, um, so yeah, so crop insurance, um, you know, it, it does help out with that because within crop insurance, it has disaster as a part of a coverage. But my problem with that is uh, crop insurance hasn't caught up with the era of crops that we grow now. And they haven't been able to update their system to be able to change out um, disasters. So basically, you know, crop insurance, they have a disaster coverage, but it only probably just cover hurricanes and tornadoes. They need to go in and create ways based on the climate that we have, the, the changes in the climate now, and revise those um, policy so people you know can take advantage of that crop insurance for one you know someone like me that grows commodity and vegetables i rely highly on crop insurance because you know farming is a risk itself so you know with me not being properly covered you know that's a uh you know a problem too and i just hate the fact that crop insurance only based disasters off of a tornado or a hurricane rather than um you know well i, I can't say that because in some in some cases in, with me growing peanuts, um, if if my crop I can have a crop disaster based on not not enough water, too much water, um, hurricane. So um, in certain commodities and certain crops have that coverage for that climate change. Like you know you know that like the insurance company know that you may run into these issues that has nothing to do with you. So if, you know I feel like crop insurance is beneficial. It's just you is finding that crop insurance agency that will deal with the particular crop you will based on if you have any um, climate problems. But, you know, to answer that question, yes, I have crop insurance and um, yes, they do cover for a certain climate um, disasters that can happen to your crop. Thank you so much, Sed. Uh, for issue of time, we're going to we're going to move on, but we can circle back to some of these questions in the panel at the end.
So our last speaker, but definitely not least, is Andrew Walmsley. Um, he joined the American Farm Bureau Federation in 2011 as Director of Congressional Relations. Andrew focuses on policy as well as managing energy, climate, transportation, and biotechnology issues for the Farm Bureau. He currently chairs the Farmers for a Sustainable Future Coalition, is a founding member of the Food and Agriculture Climate Alliance as well. Uh, welcome, Andrew, and take it away. Well, Kerry, thank you uh, for allowing me to join y'all. It's, it's great to be with some friends in Georgia. Uh, it's always tough to, to be last on a, on a great panel that y'all have heard so far. So hopefully I won't lose any of your interest. Uh, and also appreciate you allowing a couple of Gators on the panel, even though this is a Georgia webinar, my good friend Casey going before we're, we're both proud Gators, but uh, just appreciate the chance to visit with y'all. I'm gonna uh, hopefully build on all of, of everything you've heard so far this morning. Uh, and kind of take it back into maybe more of a national view, uh, some of the conversations that are taking place in Washington and what we're doing across American agriculture. So I will share some slides with y'all. Uh, somebody holler if you can't see them, but they, hopefully they're up there. You know, this debate around agriculture and climate uh, is an interesting one, uh, particularly when you look from the policy side. You know, the last time Washington, D.C. Uh, had a serious debate around climate was 10 to 11 years ago, uh, around cap and trade and Waxman marking. Uh, this was a bill uh, that, that caused a lot of concern in agriculture and ultimately wasn't signed into law. Uh, and quite frankly, uh, this issue has probably been put on the back burner quite a bit in DC. But during this same time, we've seen a lot of conversations, a lot of commitments from the private sector. Uh, we're seeing you know, uh, farmers being impacted by some of those commitments through food chain partners. Uh, but it wasn't really until last Congress that I believe the debate has come back to Washington and will we see additional action? If you recall uh, last year or two years ago, I guess it's now the Green New Deal was introduced and this caused a lot of conversation and consternation across the countryside and across Capitol Hill. But with that, it provided us an opportunity, an opportunity uh, for Farm Bureau to sit down with some of our champions on the Hill, but others in the agriculture community to have a discussion around climate, one that hadn't taken place in a while. Uh, you know, Farm Bureau, if you're not familiar with us, you, you might know Georgia Farm Bureau as an insurance company. That is a member benefit that we do provide. Uh, but on the Federation, and that's the side I work on, we, we are completely member driven. Uh, we are made up of grassroots members. Uh, I, I know Casey's a member um, that dictate our policy. Those are our marching orders as staff. We come together at the county, um, those county farm bureaus come together to create the state farm bureaus and the state farm bureaus come together to create the American Farm Bureau, including Puerto Rico. And so uh, we are led by farmer members. Our board is made up of, of farmers. Our president uh, is actually the former president of Georgia Farm Bureau. Zippy Duval uh, is a farmer in Georgia uh, and serves as our elected president uh, of our organization. So as I talk through policy, that's just a little background to know that our policy is developed, voted on at the local, state, and national level each year. And that's how we make our decisions on what we advocate for. A little bit of that background out of the way, you'll see a list of other commodity groups here. This is a group that we've brought together called Farmers for a Sustainable Future. It is an ag producer group uh, organization uh, looking to, to kind of advocate and work on these issues on behalf of American agriculture. One of the first things we wanted to do, though, is to take a step back and say, what is our story? What, what numbers out, are out there with publicly available data? Uh, and what can we do with this? And once we discover that, I, we thought it was really important to start having this conversation, not only on Capitol Hill, but with our membership to get them more comfortable around this idea of climate policy, climate change, to talk about what they're experiencing, uh, because it's been a difficult subject. Uh, it's one that, that, you know, regulation could cause a lot of harm to ag, but there's a lot of good that we're doing here and we want to build upon that. This slide, I think, is important to kind of set a framework. Uh, you know, you heard a little bit of talk about uh, global greenhouse gas emissions attributable to ag. Uh, from the latest UN numbers, uh, you know, worldwide uh, agricultural emissions are close to 25%. In the U.S., we're actually 10%. Uh, one of those main reasons uh, is, I would say, this slide is the work that the University of Georgia has done and our other land-grant universities on sustainable intensification, on us being able to produce more with less. So in roughly two generations, we've increased our outputs in American agriculture by over 287%, while our inputs have remained relatively flat. 
Uh, that's attributable to multiple factors, but a lot of that is that research from our land grants and then that extension of that research into the hands of our farmers and ranchers. It's through our improved genetics uh, in, in our herds. It's, it's better feed efficiencies, improved genetics through biotechnology and those crops that, that have adopted uh, those te techniques. It's, it's precision agriculture. It's, it's getting much better uh, at being stewards and producing more per acre. Just another number to throw out there, I don't have it on the chart, but if you look in the last 30 years, we've lost almost 30 million acres of cropland across this country. Uh, most of that's to development. But of the cropland we have left, uh, our carbon flux, our carbon emissions have remained relatively steady over those 30 years while we're producing 50% more per acre. So uh, really a remarkable story when you think about American agriculture. And this has all been done, not with a mandate, um, but with market uh, principles or reactions or voluntary incentives that I'll go into a little bit further. We've talked a lot about greenhouse gases today. Uh, just to give you another idea of, of what we're talking about, that red line is U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. That light green line is land use sinks. So our forestry, our grasslands, other areas that we are sequestering carbon. Uh, as we look forward at policy proposals, the question is how do we reduce the red while increasing the green? Uh, and our goal at Farm Bureau is to do that in a way that's sustainable, obviously, but also ensures economic viability, profitability for our members, because uh, there's no way to implement these practices and provide what is a unique service in agriculture, not only emission reductions, but the ability to sequester carbon. So that's important as we move forward. We talk about livestock a lot. Um, obviously, there's different views around eating meat. There's, there's obviously activist organizations out there. There's those that may be concerned about their health. Uh, there's a lot of folks that I call conflict entrepreneurs that like to vilify modern ag uh, to, to, to gain a penny off the farmer's back. But let's just talk about reality of where we're at with livestock emissions. Uh, we're less than 4%. Uh, you can see how beef, cattle, dairy, and swine's broken out. Recognizing that there is an emission there, uh, we always are trying to strive for improvement. How do we get better? What are some of those trends? So if we look in the last 30 years on our per unit of emissions, our emissions per unit of production, with dairy, we're down 25%, swine, we're down 20%, and beef cattle, we're down almost 10%. So uh, this is something we want to continue to build upon uh, and continue to make improvements, but we're going to need partners. Another way to look at this on the crop side, this is another 30-year snapshot. If we were to produce what we produced in American agriculture, in 2018, uh, utilizing land in 1990 that was under production or, or production practices back then, we would have needed 40, more, 40 million more acres of corn, 42 million more acres of soybean, uh, 4 million more acres of cotton. So just once again, we're continuing to, to, to produce more while utilizing less. You know, for American agriculture, it's not just production and on farm, it's the other things that we support, the other things that we can be involved with. And energy is a big issue, right? When you look at how the different economic sectors are broken out for greenhouse gas emissions, uh, energy is a big one. Uh, the last snapshot we have of American agriculture from the, the agriculture census, uh, we've seen a 132% increase in on farm adoption of renewable energy. And I think when that's updated, that'll be an even higher number as we continue to see costs go down as it relates to, to solar. Obviously, where we have wind resources, we have a lot of investment. You've got methane digesters being adopted in other parts of their states. I know there's some large projects ongoing in Georgia uh, that should be up and running here soon. For American agriculture, even outside of Georgia, but what's really important uh, and especially important as we go forward in this debate is, is around biofuels. Uh, biofuels is a homegrown fuel success story for, for rural America. It's an economic driver for many of our rural communities. It's a demand driver for, for our corn crop. Uh, in 2018 alone, the use of biofuels such as ethanol and biodiesel reduced greenhouse gas emissions by 71 million metric tons. That's equivalent of taking 17 million cars off the road. So those are real emission reductions taking place today and something that we feel is important going forward as Congress discuss future transportation proposals. Look, electric vehicles are great. Uh, we're going to see uh, more adoption of that. You know, I think Zed got into this a little bit earlier on um, talking about the need for diesel. Uh, we still have to produce a crop. We still need tractors. Um, but we also, you know, should recognize the savings that we have from a homegrown source like biofuel. You hear a lot of talk, um, you know, how do we bring ag into the fold? Well, I would argue in a lot of ways we have a Green New Deal in agriculture, and that's the farm bill. Uh, a farm bill is, is uh, authorized every five years. It really sets agricultural policy in this country. 
one of the important titles of the Farm Bill, Title II, is the conservation title. And so when you look just at federal level of conservation programs across this country, over 140 million acres is enrolled in a conservation plan. That land area is equivalent to the states of California and New York State, not the city, the state combined. Uh, so as we go forward in this debate, one of the things we think that's really important is to have this discussion in the appropriate committees of jurisdiction, which is the Senate and House Ag Committees. And they are. Uh, this new Congress, the first hearing in the House, uh, in the House Ag Committee uh, was on climate. Uh, our president, Zippy Duval, testified there. Uh, you know, he, uh, Pam was also a panelist on there. She, she uh, mentioned that, you know, Zippy got a lot of questions. Jim Cantori was on there growing up in Florida when the committee told me that they were going to have Jim Cantori there. I was worried because usually when he shows up, all hell breaks loose. But Pam, I think we were able to, to survive that hearing all right. You know, for the Senate Ag Committee, their first hearing was in March. Uh, on, and its first hearing was on climate. And we also had a witness there, our Arizona president uh, testifying. You know, you heard Casey and Zed talk about it too, is that diversity of agriculture is huge, just within a county, within a state and across this country. And so a one size fits all approach when it comes to policy uh, isn't gonna work for ag. But we as an industry are committed to finding solutions. Uh, one of the opportunities we had last year uh, building off of our work in Farmers for a Sustainable Future was to work with some groups that we not necessarily always work with, uh, particularly on a climate issue. We might work with them on some other areas, but we came together last year to create what is now known as, as the Food and Agriculture Climate Alliance. Um, this is the first alliance of its kind uh, where the environmental community and the farming community has come together to make recommendations around climate. Uh, so Farm Bureau, Environmental Defense Fund, uh, nature, uh, the National Council of Farmer Cooperatives and National Farmers Union were the four chairs, co-founders. We invited some others in to have the original eight to have these policy discussions. Out of that, we came up with over 40 policy recommendations, three overarching principles here that they have to be voluntary incentive based. They got to be grounded in science and we need to be promoting resiliency, not just on our farms, but for the environment and our rural communities. Overarching goal is to do no harm. Uh, of those, we broke them out into six working areas, soil health, livestock and dairy, forest and wood products, energy, food loss and waste, and finally, research. You can find these recommendations on agclimatealliance.com. Uh, obviously, we won't run through them today, but happy to answer questions there. Since our original eight, we have grown our membership to over 60 members. Uh, these are some of the steering committee members. So really an opportunity to start having the conversation, not only with farmers and ranchers in our rural communities, but with our lawmakers, with this new administration and Congress. With that, I'm going to stop because I'm out of time. Uh, just want to share a slide for you, information from Farm Bureau. We're doing a primer on carbon markets and uh, uh, what could be coming in some of these private markets. Sign up for this. This is free. And I just wanted to share my contact information. Um, don't abuse it, but that is my cell phone. And that is my email and happy to answer questions uh, outside of this webinar just because I know we are a little time constrained. So with that, Carrie, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much. That was so much um, great information. All right, we've got a couple of questions and then we're going to open it up um, to everyone. Here's one from Emily Birchfield. The USDA ERS reports a negative mean farm income of about um, $1,000 uh, for U.S. farmers over the last decade. Why the disconnect between the huge productivity gains you mentioned and farmer livelihoods? Well, we're producing more, but, you know, costs continue to go up. We continue to make investments. You see, continue to see cropland uh, prices go up. And then, you know, the unfortunate matter is ag, we're price takers, not price makers. And so, uh, we do have those couple of years that are really good, and then you have some down years, and those trends uh, just happen to take place. That's why one of the reasons we've got farm bills to help mitigate uh, some of those losses. And I really turned to said and, and Casey to probably talk a little bit more on their personal experiences. Uh, you know, we really did see a sea shift in the last couple of years with government assistance um, because of the trade war with China, market facilitation payments, and then the pandemic. Uh, that is not sustainable. And so as we transition from that, uh, what growing pains are we going to see out there? Luckily, we're seeing an uptick in some commodity prices. China is purchasing a little bit more that has some impacts, but there are so much flux fluctuations, diversity in agriculture. It's not the same story for all farmers, 
But overall, we've had some very tough years over the last several years. Casey and Seth, do you have anything to add to that? I'll just echo what Andrew said. It's definitely been um, unprecedented for us here in Southwest Georgia between the um, the hurricane and then the trade wars and then the pandemic. <laughs> so it's, it's just been uh, quite a few challenges to navigate. And uh, like Andrew said, there were definitely some new government programs, but um, our, our costs are continuing to, to go way up. Fertilizer this year is, is unbelievably expensive. And so we're just navigating things like that almost all the time. Said, did you have anything to add or should we move on to the next question? Um, I didn't have anything to add. Thank you. Um, okay, so the next question for Andrew is, what are some major changes you think need to be made in the next iteration of the Farm Bill to ensure a sustainable future for US farmers and farms? No, that's a great question. You know, farm bills are every five years. Typically, we just got done with the 2018 farm bill. We're starting to prepare for the 2023 farm bill, and it provides an opportunity on that five year timeline to make improvements. And so, you know, a lot of the important risk management tools are in the farm bill. Uh, you know, commodity title that helps a lot of our, our grain production. We've got crop insurance that, you know, does have some challenges, as Casey pointed out, but does help a lot of other farmers too. Uh, you know, those are tools that we think are important, but a lot of the focus for the next farm bill is going to be in that conservation title. Uh, that's one of the reasons I think you're seeing all these different groups come together, as that will probably be the next policy opportunity to provide additional resources to farmers. So if we can find some additional funding, work within the current infrastructure that we have at USDA to build on the other resource management concerns we have, those programs that are out there is a great framework. But how do we start implementing more climate smart practices? In a lot of ways, that's going to take money, but then it's also going to take technical assistance. It's going to take partners. It's working with our land grants. It's working with Georgia. It's working, you know, University of Georgia. It's working uh, with our input providers, with our certified crop uh, advisors and folks like that. So uh, I think that's where you're going to see a lot of shift in the next farm bill is how do we improve these conservation programs and help get more additional resources on the ground. Excellent. And the last one that went specifically to Andrew, and then we'll open it up for everyone. Um, oops, let me find it again. Um, does the Georgia Farm Bureau share the Federation's proactive approach on climate issues? Does it support the FACA recommendations? And in your answer, please let us know what FACA is for those of us who don't know. Yeah, so FACA is the Food and Agriculture Climate Alliance. Uh, it is this broader group that, it, that has grown out. Georgia Farm Bureau is part of American Farm Bureau. And so in a way they have endorsed that, uh, you know, it was something we brought to our board. Georgia Farm Bureau sits on our board and there was a unanimous decision to support those recommendations. Now individual state farm bureaus can go further and join as a general member of, of FACA. I'm not sure if they have done that, state, done that yet. Um, but we work very closely uh, with Georgia Farm Bureau, their National Affairs Coordinator, Trip Cofield, good friend of mine uh, and they are definitely engaged. I've actually uh, working with them to set up several meetings uh, with some of your delegation to talk about this issue. So uh, I don't know if they have the official put their name on the website, yes, but they are endorsed and partners with us in this in this uh, conversation going forward. Excellent. Does anybody else want to add to that? I was just going to mention, Carrie, that uh, Georgia Farm Bureau invited me to speak about that this morning, which is why I was a little bit late to uh, this webinar. So uh, they've been they, <laughs> so they've been they've been great about uh, trying to open that up, especially to our, our congressional leaders about how um, how important it is for farmers to be at the table um, on this issue. Excellent. Um, so we've got a few questions and a little bit of time that I thought I could put out to everyone. So anyone who feels like they want to answer. Um, this one is thinking about STEM programs in K-12. Um, relating the real world application of new tools would be useful for advancing technical capabilities, awareness of ecological impacts and solutions for climate mitigation. Are STEM programs available for K-12 students to learn about robotics, computer coding to advance agricultural practices? And I would add that, you know, what kind of climate information are we getting in that, in that K-12 as well to, um, to really foster leadership into the future? Does anybody have Con comments on that. 
I saw Pam kick off. I will say that the American Farm Bureau has our foundation, uh, which is an educational foundation that develops uh, ag literacy uh, and ag specific topics. I know a lot of the work that they've worked on is trying to build into that STEM curriculum. And so working with partners like Ag in the Classroom, lo our local extension agents, we've been developing uh, those resources for teachers. I think we also have uh, some grants that you can apply for that, that we uh, award annually, but there are tons of, of uh, resources if you Google American Farm Bureau Foundation, we actually have our own publishing company now where we're putting out ag accurate books in addition to our resources for teachers. And then we have a whole website that's designed My American Farm that do have STEM level uh, or STEM appropriate um, games for uh, elementary school children, especially to play that are ag related. So that, I know that's a resource out there if folks are, are looking for it. Pam, did you have anything to add? I was just going to add that, I mean, to me, it seems that there's a real opportunity there because I don't think a lot of schools really address agricultural production and things like that. Um, they're looking at more general STEM kind of questions. And I think there's a real opportunity there. And I'm glad to hear that the Farm Bureau is doing some of that. And I know that groups like 4-H and Extension are also working on outreach um, to K-12 educators as well. Um, it's a, it's a brand new area. I think there's a lot of opportunity, but I don't think there's been a lot of movement. Although I admit that I don't spend a lot of time looking at it. Uh, I work with some individual school teachers, but I don't work with uh, folks that are involved in de developing curriculum. So I think that's a, an area that we really could improve things. Did anybody else have anything they wanted to add and said, Casey, before we move on? Excellent. Um, here's a question. Are there any national efforts out there interested in reviving agrodiversity or maybe bringing those kinds of agricultural techniques into conservation in ag? I think there's been some movement to doing things like um, silviculture. So, you know, where you where you grow um, livestock in the middle of a of forest production, a solo pasture, I guess is what they call it. So there are some movements to, to do um, more integrative kind of agricultural approaches where you can do more than one thing at the same time. Um, but again, I think it's an area where there could be more work done as well. Anyone else want to add to that? Uh, I have a question here that was um, put in a little while back after said talked, but um, I'm sure other people might be able to add to it, but this was directed to said. Um, Conservation agriculture is one of Drawdown Georgia's identified 20 solutions for addressing climate change. From your perspective, what is the best way for DG proponents and others who are interested in advancing conservation agriculture to support farmers like you? What policy changes and other initiatives would help you and farmers like you sustain and expand your farms? Said, or I can jump to that, Carrie. Um, yeah, thank you. Is a big okay, yeah, I'll I'll go quickly, and then of course, said can can add to to that, but. Um, one thing that has been a dream of mine for a long time is I mentioned the um, USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, I think said did as well, and they have some incredible conservation programs for farmers and they're all the voluntary incentive based programs, but that um, process can be a little bit intimidating for some farmers because it's a lot of paperwork there's it's, it's just a lot of, of government process you have to go through and so one of my dreams from a policy perspective for a long time would be to create a state program that mirrors that um, so for example florida is a great example of that because they um the state of florida has a 20 million dollar a year best management practice program that they they implement at the state level that um, really supports some of those practices and some of those farmers that may not engage at the federal level. Maybe they're, um, you know, maybe the process is just too, too burdensome for them at the federal level, but the state process is a little bit easier. So um, 
and, and just so you know, even though the NRCS in Georgia, we have a huge budget for conservation programs to the tune of probably, um, I don't want to misquote, but it's millions of dollars, but I've, I've heard that on average that only meets about a third of the demand. Um, so, you know, those types of programs really help lower that barrier to trying a new conservation practice or implementing a new conservation practice on the farm. So I've always wanted to see a state program like that. And, and, and I hope that, that one day I'll see that in, in Georgia as even a pilot program to start. I think that's excellent and a really good way to transition to um, ending our webinar as we're, we're, we're getting a little low on the questions, which I think is great because we're getting we're running out of time. But um, I think it would be great to hear from each of our panelists about something that they um, they would love to see in the future uh, happen. And it you know can be something easily feasible or or something that um, you know it would just be a you know a wonderful asset uh, if we could um, if we could move in that direction. Uh, does anybody want to add something that would be fantastic to see happening? I can jump in. Um, one of the things that I spend a lot of time working at in research is uh, looking at precision ag and, and smart irrigation. And I think, uh, you know, there's a real potential for, for conserving water, using it a, a lot more wisely in the future. Um, but you need to educate people about it. You need to find ways for them to um, monitor their fields using cheaper sensors. And so we're looking at that now. Um, you know, it's, it's being able to save water also saves fuel and it can save fertilizer as well. And so that's one thing that I think we need. We also need to make sure that people have access to that information. So, you know, when I'm listening to uh, comments about more broadband for rural areas, I think that's going to be really critical because if you don't have access to the information, you can't use it. I think that's excellent. Thinking about uh, water into the future and also um, how everyone is going to be able to access those kinds of technologies. Anyone else? Um, I just said, you can't hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, um, so I, I'm thinking back on what you said earlier about the conservationists. Um, so, you know, what I would like to see, um, I work for, you know, NRCS, so I know about the conservation. So I'm, I get kind of educated and, you know, frustrated at the same time with being a farmer. So um, <laughs> what I can say is, um, start creating um, conservation that's based on what farmers are already doing. Um, a lot of people that go apply for conservation is, is something that they have to tweak on their farm or change up. So if they can base a lot of those conservationists on what farmers are already doing, rather than what they think they're doing and what they think is work, working, because a lot of those practices and stuff comes from people that sit in the office and desk and never goes on the farm or never know what the problem is. And, Stuff like that. So I would love to see people listening to farmers basing conservation and funding off of what's currently going on. That's excellent. Um, does anybody else, uh, Andrew or Casey, if you wanted to add to what you said before? I think Zed makes a, a great point. Um, that's you know one of the frustrations we hear, and that's some of the things that we try to get at with our recommendations at the Food and Agriculture Climate Alliance. One thing I'd like to see again uh, is something that was maybe a little bit before its time, and there's folks that are on this phone that were, or on this call that were involved with it. I'd like to see the so Southeast Climate Consortium model come back. Uh, you know, I think that's just a really good structure um, to, to deal with regional challenges, to link experts. And the problem with climate so much is, is, is having a trusted voice in this. You know, I think farmers, for right or wrong, I mostly think right, are hesitant from DC sometimes and even USDA and, and questions around NRCS, but we trust our land grants. They're, they're our partners. We root for them on Saturdays, you know, so that model I would love to see built out with the funding that's necessary to look at the practices that are taking place in real time. Uh, you know, and how do we bring extension in the 21st century? I think this call has proven we need broadband and that's a component, not just from a precision ag, but getting our farmers connected and, and being able to, to move forward in, in quality of life. But that, that model of Southeast Com uh, Climate Consortium is one I'd like to see come back. Uh, and before, um, Casey, did you have something to add? We had one more question that I wanted to get in before the end. <laughs> you, can, you can add something if you want. <laughs> Uh, this question just popped up from Julia Gaskin. Um, 
Hey, Julia. Uh, there are a lot, there's been a lot of discussion about technology and precision ag as adaptation to climate change, but little discussion about systems approach with conservation tillage, cover crops and crop rotation that rely on biological compo um, component. We know this works, but adoption is low. Why is Farm Bureau and others not helping move these known practices forward as a solution? So I'm not sure if I'm missing part of that question, but uh, that's something we've been supportive of. If you, I don't have this slide in my deck, but we've seen a 50% increase in the last five years or so alone in conservation tillage. We see additional cover crops being planted. Uh, I think we're looking at a whole systems approach at what works and providing a diversity of options for farmers. This goes back to Casey's point earlier. It has to be voluntary though because what works in Georgia doesn't necessarily work in North Dakota or in Arizona. Uh, there's got to be a menu of options, and that's what we're advocating for. That's what, once again, back to the FACA recommendations, is looking at those using the regional uh, climate hubs at USDA, calling for additional agricultural research. Can we use biologicals? How do we reduce, you know, um, petroleum product use? I mean, those are both emission reductions that could play into a climate market, but uh, reduces cost for the farmer. Uh, we obviously can impact yield uh, as we try to move forward. We've got to have that balance as well. So it, it, we are definitely supportive of those ideas. And, and I think you're seeing farmers where it makes practical economic and labor sense, those practices being adopted. Uh, you know, it, it's really the, the monetary side's important, um, but sometimes you have constraints. You know, if you're only one farmer or, or you're, you're one or two, um, how do you plant cover crops when you're in the middle of harvest in some sections of the, the country? I mean, you can't convince someone to get off that tractor when when they're harvesting their livelihood, even though they might want to plant cover. I mean, that's just an example of some of the challenges. I'm sure Casey can expand on that too, but where it's practical, absolutely, we are pushing for those types of solutions. That's great to hear. Yeah, and I'll just add, I know those are those are really important practices that we have on our farm too. Uh, crop rotation is just one of those things. I, I don't know very many farmers who don't employ crop rotation because it just, it makes sense um, to do that. It's, it, you know, there are some farmers that maybe they don't have the land capacity and they're not able to rotate their crops, but it's, um, as, as anyone, as our extension agents always tell us, if you plant peanuts over and over again, they're legumes and they're going to, um, they're not going to be, it's not good to plant them over and over again. You're going to get low yields. You're going to hurt your soil. So the crop rotation, it's, it's not just a conservation practice. It's something that actually helps uh, the quality and vigor of the next crop. And then um, conservation tillage and cover crops, we, we are fortunate to be able to use those on our farm. I will say that in Georgia, and, and Julia, you've probably seen this in, in some of the work you've done. I think one of the challenges is peanuts. Um, you can do conservation tillage and peanuts but it is a little more challenging um, because part of our harvest process is digging the peanuts. Um, so at some point we are going to break that soil. So it's a little different than that like corn and soybean rotation that you would see in the Midwest where it's a no brainer. Um, you know, we're, we're not able, some, some farmers have implemented it successfully. We have tried and failed, um, but we use conservation tillage on all of our other crops. So um, it, it may purely just be the, the type of, of system that we have that makes it a little more challenging in, in our community. Well, I'd like to personally thank everybody for their questions and the panelists for their answers, and I'm going to pass it back over. But um, my final word is there's, you know, a lot that we've talked about today, and clearly uh, climate change and agriculture is a main topic that we need to keep talking about and discussing here in Georgia. Thank you very much. Awesome. Well, I, I didn't introduce myself earlier on the webinar. My name is Rachel Usher. And I work with the Georgia Climate Project. And we would just like to um, take a second to thank everyone who joined us today, all of the participants. Thank you for attending. We'd also like to thank our fabulous panel of um, experts that's been here today, Pam Knox, Casey, Sed, Andrew, and our host, Carrie. Thank you so much. Um, also wanted to give a quick shout out to some folks behind the scenes, Jill Gamble, Daniel Rockford, Jenna Frankie, and IT support from Brandon. We really appreciate it. Um, for all of the participants that are still here, you're going to get a pop-up link um, with a survey to fill out. We really do encourage you to let us know what you thought about the webinar today. It'll also be landing in your inboxes, but thanks again for joining us this Wednesday, and thanks again to everyone for a wonderful discussion. Bye, y'all.